go on the recording side. Okay. So, hey everybody, I'm Orion Klagesmont. I'm a PhD student at Cornell. Uh, and I'm going to walk you guys through some of our work today on understanding risks and non custodial stable trends. So, things focusing on deleveraging spirals and attacking samples. Uh, is the volume? Okay, there's going to be a penalty close up, but okay. yeah, let me know if there's a problem later. So stable coins are a centerpiece of decentralized finance, which is rapidly growing and increasingly complex. So in just two years, it's grown to $500 million in assets, and it's evolved into a pretty complicated system of composability between a number of different protocols. And in the financial world, Complex systems usually come with complex risks. So an example that everybody's aware of is the 2008 financial crisis, where we had some contracts that were intended to really stabilize the system, but ended up having a huge destabilizing force. But decentralized finance and blockchain is different, right? The whole idea is to try to correct some of the problems from the traditional financial system. Well, it turns out that DeFi indeed has some complex risks. So here's Nubits, one of the first stable coins. Uh, which is plummeted trading at cents on the dollars these days. Here's BitUSD, which had a, a major depegging event last December. Here's Steam Dollars, which has struggled to maintain its peg over the last year. Here's BitBTC, a synthetic asset trying to track Bitcoin, which has also collapsed. Uh, in more recent news, this past summer, Synthetic suffered an Oracle attack. And a month later, Terra, another stablecoin, suffered two Oracle attacks. The problem with these systems is that we really have sort of little formal understanding of how they work. They end up having some complex feedback effects. Uh, there's no truly stable asset that's efficiently accessible within these systems. This is actually what we're really trying to create in the first place with stable coins. And it involves complex interaction of different agents. So in this, in this talk, uh, we're going to go through a little bit about understanding stable coins, sort of motivating how they're different from existing currency models and then go through a high-level overview of our paper, which introduces a new model to try to understand these uh, stablecoin systems a little better. So a stablecoin aims to be a protocol that uh, stabilizes the market price uh, or purchasing power of the coin uh, to become a more usable uh, and adoptable cryptocurrency. And there are two main types of stablecoins. One is a custodial coin, where some custodian holds the reserve assets off chain. This is something like Tether which reintroduces counterparty risk back into cryptocurrencies. And then there are non-custodial systems. Uh, and these systems, which is what we're starting <coughs> in this paper, uh, involve on-chain mechanisms to try to target stability. So an example here is MakerDAO's DAI. Um, and this is like the systems we saw uh, in the slides earlier. Uh, they end up having very similar designs, currently are very ad hoc, because we don't really understand these systems very well, and so amenable to potential failure. So let's go through a simple example of, uh, of one of these systems. This is a simple contract for difference. So here, we have a contract that's pairing two different agents, a stablecoin holder and a speculator. So let's say they each put in one Ether currently worth $100 into the contract. So now there's two Ether worth $200 in the contract. And now, as time moves forward, the price oracle updates the contract with the new price of Ether. Let's say it's $80. And then the contract settles returning $100 worth of Ether, now 1.25 Ether to the stablecoin holder, and the remainder to the speculator. But of course, if the direction of the price movement had been different, the speculator would have made a profit here, and that's what they were really betting on. That's why they partake in these systems. So this is similar to a forward contract. Importantly, except the price is really only fixed in the terms, uh, while the payout is in this risky collateral. And you can't really settle in US dollars on a blockchain, uh, so that's one limitation. And in these markets, they us there are usually heavy frictions between converting between, uh, between these risky assets and fiat. And in many jurisdictions, it may not even be possible. And so if you're a stable point holder and there's a settlement event, it may actually be undesirable for you because now you're holding a risky asset and to uh, maintain a stable coin position uh, would involve buying back into stable coins, uh, a similar stable coin. And there's no guarantee that a good market for that continues to exist in all environments. So this has motivated some of the new designs, which is what we're focusing on in our modeling work, uh, to make, a, make stable coins that perform in this sort of way, but don't have sort of a set expiration date. 
Uh, so in these systems, you again have a speculator. Uh, let's say they currently lock one ETH worth $100 into a contract, and they create 50 stable coins against, or some amount, up to some over collateral threshold. So if you think in terms of balance sheets, this is what the speculator's balance sheet looks like now. And then they can take those 50 stable coins and go to a stable coin market and trade for about 0.5 ETH. Uh, and I say about because it depends on what the market is willing to bear, and that com uh, turns out to be pretty complex to understand. Um, and this stablecoin market works through some idea of arbitrage. But importantly, it's not real arbitrage because it depends on sort of assumptions about how the system continues to grow. <coughs> and then at any time, the speculator can repurchase those 50 stablecoins to unlock their collateral. What they're essentially getting is a leveraged position to make a leveraged bet on this risky asset. And at some, time, at some point, they may want to exit that leveraged position. And then the other side of the stablecoin market is taken by these stablecoin holders who buy the stablecoins and want to maintain a stable position for some sort of uh, risk reason, or potentially in the future for purchasing reasons. So now, as time evolves, a uh, price oracle again updates this contract to tell what the new price of Ether is, and if the collateral value decreases below some threshold, then the speculator can be partially liquidated to try to bring them back within that threshold. Uh, and so you can see two main sort of areas of weaknesses evolving in this system. One is around the price oracle, which if you can manipulate it, you can manipulate the entire system. And the other is around the stablecoin market, which if it collapses, it also brings down the system. And then at any point, there could be some idea of like this global settlement, where this is getting back to what would happen in the original contract for difference. The, the contract is settled, the stablecoin holders can exchange their stablecoins for Ether at the last oracle price, and the remainder goes to speculators. But this is meant as sort of a last resort sort of thing, uh, and not intended to, to really take effect. So an important question in these models is, can we use the existing literature on currency peg models to try to understand these? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So in traditional currency peg models, we're really looking at a game played between currency holders, and there's a government issuer, which is not really a player in the game. They're sort of mechanically committed to uh, to maintaining stability for its own sake. But now, in these stablecoin systems, we're really replacing the government issuer role with decentralized speculators, who are now players in the game. So they issue and withdraw stablecoins to optimize their profits over the long term. They're not, they're importantly not committed to maintaining any idea of the peg. And the best we can hope for is that the protocol is well designed and the peg is maintained through incentives uh, with some high probability. And so this motivates the model that's, that we're building, which uh, it's, we're building up a model of the, the setting we uh, put forward in the previous slides in, that, uh, in those pictures. And so we have two agents, uh, these stable point holders who are seeking stability and provide sort of the demand side of, of the equation with some elasticity, and speculators who choose leverage bets that are backing the stable coin. And there are two assets, Ether, which is our risky asset with an exogenous price, and stablecoin, which has our endogenous price that we're trying to understand, which is over collateralized in, in, the, in the risky asset. And then there's a stablecoin market, uh, which clears by setting the demand equal to the supply in the target terms. In this case, the symbol is US dollars. And this is similar in concept to how clearing works on US one. And so in our paper, we're focusing on understanding uh, how speculators make decisions. And so in our model, uh, the speculators decide how to change the stablecoin supply uh, to maximize their next period expected returns, subject to some constraints. So this is, to, in some idea, an idea of honest behavior in these systems of these speculators, because the system designers really intend for the systems to be maintained through this idea of arbitrage. If the price of the stablecoin is trading too high or too low, then there's some idea of incentives for these stablecoin issuers, these speculators, to change the supply to bring it back in line with the target. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier, that's not really true arbitrage. It depends on some assumptions about the system's continued performance. So these speculators are then uh, they're subject first to liquidation constraint. And this is inherent to the protocol. It says how over collateralized their positions have to be. And then in our model, they're also subject to a risk constraint, which is self-imposed by the speculator. It says how much do the speculator want to avoid liquidation. 
Um, so some examples of how to formulate this might be like a value by risk constraint, which is consistent with an idea of like a margin of safety. You want to avoid liquidations with some probability, but importantly, we can consider a number of other formulations in our model. So from our model, we're able to uh, back out some analytical results that help us understand these systems. So the first is that there's a bound to the speculator's ability to maintain the market. It looks something like, uh, like this, but the exact form is not really important for this talk. The second result is that speculators face the limits on how quickly they can reduce leverage, even if they're bringing in capital from outside of the system. And this leads to what we call deleveraging spirals, uh, where a speculator can end up having to repurchase stable coins at an increasing price as liquidity dries up in the market. So let's walk through intuitively how this uh, sort of works. So here, we're looking at a measure of the price of the stablecoin, some measures of demand and supply in the stablecoin market, and on the far side, uh, the collateral in the system. And so now, if there's a liquidation, uh, collateral is used to reduce the supply uh, by buying back stablecoins, uh, which leads to an imbalance between supply and demand, and to make up for that, that leads to an increase in price in the stablecoin and a decrease in the demand to bring things back in line. But now if we're looking at, uh, starting at this state, if there's another wave of liquidations, because the price is higher, uh, there's less liquidity in the market, the more collateral needs to be used to buy back the same amount of supply uh, to have the same effects. And so we have sort of a potential amplification effect uh, to how much collateral and how quickly it's used. Our third analytical result describes when these systems are stable versus unstable. Um, if we add a couple more assumptions, we can tractably show that uh, if the leverage constraint for these speculators is never active, then the system converges to a steady state where we have a stable price and zero variance. And an important observation here is that this steady state may not have a price of one dollar, maybe below, could potentially be above. And then sort of outside of this stable region, when this constraint can become activated, then uh, we conjecture that volatility is bounded to above zero with high probability. And the reason here is that sort of when you're outside of this, uh, this region, you're more likely to remain outside because of this feedback effect, which leads to something like a kink in the probability distribution at this boundary. And so we can actually see some of these effects in real die data. Um, this is just a preliminary analysis of this. Um, here, uh, on this side here, we're seeing uh, an ether decline in December of last year, um, leading to a large reduction in the supply of dye and an accompanying increase in the price of dye, consistent with potentially an early stage of a deleveraging spiral. And so if that had continued for a while, we might see more extreme effects after that. Uh, and then on the far side here, uh, in sort of more normal times for DAI, um, you can see that the price, the sort of normal trading price of DAI can be below uh, the $1 target, which is sort of in line with our uh, stable region results. And sort of effects from liquidations can cause spike, uh, spike increases to the, the trading prices of DAI. Our system lets us, uh, our model also lets us do some simulations. So in these simulations, we can see these stable and unstable regions as well. We can also look at uh, sort of the effects of different speculative behaviors on volatility and sort of survival rates of the system. Uh, I'll leave that to sort of more details in the paper if you want to check it out. Another important thing from our results is that they can lead to new attack incentives. So first, an important thing is that attacking a stable coin is a different idea from a traditional <coughs> currency attack. Um, the focus here is not on breaking the willingness of the central bank to uh, maintain a bank. It's instead involving manipulating uh, the interaction of a number of speculators. And there are three sort of attack primitives that allow these attacks to happen. The first is that these deleveraging spirals uh, can lead to arbitrage-like trades around liquidations. These can be supplemented with uh, the fact that real implementations of stable coins add arbitrage to try to auto automate these liquidations. And then third, miners are, have the ability to censor and reorder transactions uh, to extract profits. So the first attack we consider, uh, if there's an ether decline, an attacker can manipulate the market to trigger and pro profit from these liquidations. So this is similar to a short squeeze-like attack on existing speculators, 
Uh, and it could be supplemented also with a bribe to miners to try to freeze uh, collateral top-up transactions. And it sort of works like this. So the attacker would buy stable coins early, uh, sort of dry up liquidity in the market. During the Ether decline, liquidations are triggered, and then the attacker can potentially earn a spread by selling at the post-liquidation prices, and also potentially can enter as a new speculator at high prices, which is good for a speculator position potentially. And sort of looking at this in our model through some examples, this could potentially be very profitable. The second attack is after there's an ether decline. An attacker could try to reorg the blockchain to trigger and profit from spiraling liquidations. And so the idea here is that a change in transaction ordering can cause more liquidations and extractable value for the speculator, which leads to the fact that if perverse incentives for these uh, attacks uh, for miners is if those rewards are greater than the mining rewards, then there's an incentive for them to, to do this attack. So what does this kind of look like? So in the current state of the system, we might have a timeline of the transaction history, and say this is the Oracle price feed, and now the attacker, or, uh, and then there are liquidations in the current timeline here. And now the attacker wants to uh, branch the blockchain here, and importantly, they can inherit the price feed because those transactions are already signed, they can inherit the liquidations as well uh, and place themselves in the position to perform those and benefit from those. And in fact, they can uh, reorder and censor transactions to trigger even more liquidations and put themselves in the position to profit from those as well. Um, I'm sorry, if you want to <laughs> um, So there, there are also some design insights that come from, uh, from our work. So one idea is that if we're trying to figure out how to design these, the focus could be on widening a stable region and limiting the severity of the unstable region. And there are some specific sort of considerations that I, for, for DAI in particular. So there are fees in the DAI system, uh, which can actually have the effect of amplifying these deleveraging spirals. Um, but there's potentially ways that this could be reformatted in a counter-cyclical cyclical way. So that's worth exploring. A good fee mechanism could also reduce uh, speculator herd behavior and also reduce uh, the effect of these deleveraging spirals. And also there are potential better uses for uh, last resort idea of uh, MKR insurance to try to quell these deleveraging spirals. And I'll talk about these a little bit more in my paper. A uh, key factor in how severe these deleveraging spirals can be is how exchangeable is this stablecoin to alternatives outside the system. So things like stable fiat currencies or uh, stable fiat-backed cryptocurrencies. Um, and the higher this exchangeability is, the lower the feedback effects, uh, but it introduces an idea of shutdown risk, because you're really relying then on these flows outside the system to help to stabilize the system. And in, in many jurisdictions, this may not even be an option. So there's a couple sort of open questions that I'm continuing to look at along these lines. The first is expanding the strategy space. Uh, of these speculators and attackers, understanding what else could be possible in this space, and understanding governance and oracle risks, how that relates to these risks as well. And then connecting back to the first slide, uh, understanding sort of composability of risks between all of these protocols, where you could have layers upon layers of deleveraging that could potentially occur. And then eventually, we want to learn how to design more crash-resistant systems. So that wraps up the talk here. Uh, so key takeaways you can take away are that the stable coin collateral can potentially be consumed a lot faster because of these deleveraging sort of effects, and this can lead to arbitrage-like trades around liquidations and new attack incentives to consider. So there are a couple more resources here if you want to learn more, um, and you can follow me to see some of the subsequent work that I'm working on. And then we have about a minute to open up for questions, so you can talk to me after as well. I think like one key thing that your analysis is promising is like uh, you can earn a pretty high interest rate if you're holding that, um, and that seems to drive with these funds. Yeah. So. Yeah, that would factor into understanding how the demand side works, and yeah, more work needs to go on that. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for that. Why the um, uh, I didn't get right? Why the uh, more liquidity to the external world? Uh, to the system. If you go back like four or five slides, 
Okay. Uh, actually, I think we have to wrap up, but okay. uh, come talk to me right after and I can answer your question. And anyone else can talk as well or get in touch. Thanks.